Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Okay, let's do uh, this week in prophecy first. I'll lead it in. Okay. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio. Here live in England with James Jacob Prash. Jacob, uh, you're back in England, and it's time for this week in prophecy. This has been a very interesting week in prophecy, certainly in the Middle East. You've got this very convoluted situation where America, Israel, and the West, they do not like the Assad regime that Russia is backing in conjunction with Iran. However, Russia and Iran are also at odds with the same ISIS America is. And this week, the Russians claim to have killed Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, one of the leaders of ISIS, which would be interesting if it happened. ISIS has got more enemies than friends, obviously. But the problem is the enemies of ISIS are also enemies with each other. It is an ongoing, convoluted mess. The outcome of it is obviously going to be something along the lines of Isaiah chapter 17 at some point. That prophecy will without doubt need to be totally fulfilled and things cannot just keep going on the way they have been going on. We have an interesting situation now uh, after Iran was actually hit by ISIS inside of Iran, showing the vulnerabilities of Iran. That was something we talked about last week in Prophecy. But it now brings into question the stability of the Iranian regime in its present form. Uh, the Iranian elections uh, have not really changed much and will not. Iran is simply looking to play the West as best as it can to get as much concession as it can to misrepresent itself as wanting peace following the typical Islamic doctrines of Pahwid and Hudma, a false peace. Nonetheless, the death of uh, al-Bakir al-Baghdadi uh, is quite an interesting development this week in Syria, and it will have ramifications for Iran and for Israel and for Lebanon. The situation, however, continues to go on. What else is beginning to happen this week in the Middle East? We have had the largest gay parade, homosexual parade, in Israel's history. Over 200,000. That is a huge astronomical amount of people for Israel turning out in Tel Aviv. The next target, of course, is going to be Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Uh, is they going to be their next target. This lines up exactly with what the book of Revelation tells us. Um, Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was also crucified. The homosexual agenda in Israel, under satanic inspiration, has its focus fixed on Israel. And expect this to lead with some conflict between the religious people and also the homosexual community uh, of Israel. Bearing in mind, no matter what they tell you, there is much secret homosexuality taking place in ultra-Orthodox yeshivas and Hasidic yeshivas. This is something like the sex scandals of the Roman Catholic Church that the clergy tried to suppress and keep out of the media. But it goes on and everyone knows it goes on. Now, this is not good. A lot of Christians are very naive about Israel, thinking of it as a righteous nation. It is not a righteous nation. The mayor of Tel Aviv is hostile to any kind of traditional moral values from the Torah. Uh, it is not a, a nation that is enjoying God's blessing or God's grace. It is under God's judgment. And ultimately, it will, of course, make a treaty with death with the Antichrist. Christians who support Israel, such as myself, need to be aware of this and need to stop being so naive. It is as godless as any other Western society or country, including America, Britain, 
Holland, etc. It is not a righteous nation. It is a nation that is turned against the God of its fathers and against its scriptures. It's no different than America, no different than Britain, no different than Holland, no different than any other Western democracy. It is a godless nation. Moreover, the people who are in Israel, who are religious, are astounding hypocrites who are hostile to Jewish believers in Jesus particularly. This 200,000 in Tel Aviv, or even more, is again incredible, incredible number of people for a country with that demographic, with that population. Yet, the scriptures tell us that this is going to happen, and it is happening. Something else that happened this week in Maya Sharim. More and more Orthodox are becoming mainstream into Israeli society to an extent that they're serving in the army. The traditional religious cowards who don't serve in the army, who think they need to be subsidized to go to yeshivas, even though some of them are anti-Zionist. They don't believe a Jewish state can come until the Messiah comes and establishes one. They physically attacked in a gang and beat up an Israeli soldier who was orthodox because he was wearing a yarmulke. You've got now the phenomena of orthodox Jews, religious Jews, physically in gangs surrounding and beating up Israeli soldiers. That is something that you would normally think would happen in an Arab neighborhood. But no, it is happening in ultra-orthodox Jewish neighborhoods. This again points to the confusion that is the Middle East and the convoluted state spiritually and sociologically of the modern nation Israel. Again, we support Israel. We recognize God's prophetic purposes for Israel, but we know what the stage is being set for, a covenant with death. And if the Lord Yeshua were not to return, there would be no hope for Israel. Absolutely none whatsoever. But thank God there is. We also see this week in the Middle East, General Assisi, the man who saved Egypt from Barack Obama and the Muslim Brotherhood, making an offer to the government of Gaza, which is led by Hamas, saying that in exchange for 17 wanted Islamic terrorists, guilty of the most atrocious acts of terror, the Egyptian government would ease border controls with Gaza and uh, allow greater amounts of electricity to come from Egypt into Gaza. They'd also have to close the infiltration tunnels being used to smuggle terrorist arms and explosives. No word yet from Gaza, but it does show the integrity of General uh, uh, Assis, who Barack Obama opposed in favor of Islamic terror. Barack Obama and his corrupt administration, of course, were the friends of the Muslim Brotherhood, who were the sponsors of Hamas. Uh, Tara had no better friend than Barack Obama uh, in terms of the practicalities of what he did in both Iran and in Egypt. Nonetheless, let's understand what's happening here. Gaza is getting in trouble. Something has to happen. The Palestinian Authority, again, a corrupt organ who controls the West Bank under Abbas, is trying to persuade the Israelis to shut off what remaining electricity is going to Gaza. Now, while the world blames Israel for the lack of electricity and for the shortages and the problems this incurs, the impetus for doing these things is coming from rival Muslims. It's coming from rival Palestinian Muslims. Yet the media, of course, will not report this. The media will not report many things. However, watch for events to change in Gaza. Uh, it can't keep going on the way it is going on. Pressing forward, let's look at this week in the United States, the assassination attempt on a conservative pro-life congressman. If Nancy Pelosi or Charles Schumer had gotten shot, uh, the left would have been up in arms and they would have been blaming Donald Trump personally. The fact that it was a Bernie Sanders supporter 
from the left wing of the Democratic Party who are asking, are you Democrats or Republicans? The media plays this down. The media plays this down. Uh, again, utter hypocrisy. There is no more mainstream media worth watching. In my opinion, not even Fox. Fox has now declined. It's largely over. There are some good people there, but Fox is largely over. It's finished. Murdoch's sons have ruined it. Mr. Trump seems to have known this when he began going to Twitter and to social media and to alternative media than the mainstream media, Fox being the end of it. Uh, that's the situation. It's not just what's happened with this assassination attempt, but it's the way the media is mishandling it. Uh, we are coming to the point of some kind of an upheaval. There is brewing conflict. The left is out of control, it is not behaving legally or constitutionally. They're openly advocating these terrible things. This ridiculous cat, this, this so-called comedian holding the head of the President of the United States up in some kind of effigy as he was decapitated in an age where Muslims are doing the same thing with heads of the people that ISIS decapitates. This is what the left has come to. It's come to pure animalism. We've seen medical professionals, feminist medical professionals, joking about the eye popping out of the skull of an aborted embryo. We've seen the sick, shocking spectacle where trafficking in human body parts is completely illegal. Yet in the state of California, it's the person who exposed it who's being prosecuted, not the perpetrators of the crime. The left is out of control. We can pray that the Almighty raises his hand against them. It's very unlikely these people will get saved. They're too depraved. We're talking about a Romans chapter 1 situation where God has given these people over to depravity, certainly in the area of homosexuality. But it's coming to some kind of a head. Things cannot continue going on the way in which they are. Going back across the Atlantic to the Republic of Ireland this week. The Irish lead the way. Now, my mother's family is Irish, Irish Catholic. I do not say this against the Irish people. I know wonderful believers in Ireland. But Ireland was the first country in Europe to, by referendum, vote to legalize same-sex marriage. Ireland voted to legalize it. Now Ireland has elected its first openly homosexual prime minister, a Taoiseach, a prime minister, who's actually not even ethnically Irish. His parents immigrated from India. He's from Fine Gael, roughly the Irish equivalent of the Republican Party. And he is determined, absolutely determined, to liberalize abortion in the Republic of Ireland. It is only the Protestant parties of Northern Ireland, where you still have an evangelical influence to a degree, such as the Democratic Unionist Party, that are resisting same-sex marriage, that are resisting non-therapeutic abortion, and so forth. Without them, there would be absolutely no morality left in the Republic of Ireland. The majority of the pot voting population voted to legalize same-sex marriage. Now they have chosen an openly avowed homosexual prime minister who's determined to greatly liberalize the abortion laws in Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. Um, of course, homosexuality being rampant among the priests and nuns in Ireland, lesbianism and homosexuality being endemic. The Roman Catholic Church is completely discredited in Ireland. Its bishops, every one of them, have been caught in conspiracies to protect pedophile sex criminal clergy at the expense of not protecting Irish children. Ireland is a morally bankrupt nation. A morally bankrupt nation. If it wasn't for the Unionist Protestants in the North, there would be no morality left in Ireland. Now, I don't make that as a political statement, simply as a factual observation. That's the reality. They're the only ones standing against this 
abortion on demand. They're the only ones standing against same-sex marriage and so forth. Uh, that country is finished morally. There has been a growth, however, in the number of evangelicals in young people being saved, being born again in Ireland. Unfortunately, many of them are being contaminated by the usual hype and garbage that comes from abroad, be it Hillsong, be it the false teachers from the United States, the Bill Johnson crowd, and so forth. So although there is a growth in evangelicism, much of that growth is not positive. It's what Jesus warned about in Matthew 23. You go to the ends of the earth to make one convert. Uh, Hillsong is as sexually perverted as anything you'll find in the world if you look at their women's conference in New York, among other things, or the, the series of, of, of sex scandals that plagued its leadership with Frank Houston and Pat Mercedes and so forth. This is hopeless. It's a desperate, desperate situation. I can't think of a country that is more spiritually desperate in Europe right now than the Republic of Ireland. Ireland is leading Europe into a new downward spiral of moral desperation. Uh, this, of course, testifies to the abject bankruptcy, spiritually and morally, of Roman Catholicism. They're finished. They're discredited. But it does show something else. It does show that history means nothing to people. History means nothing to people. Ireland resisted Roman Catholicism up until the 8th century. Following the Council of Whitby, it still resisted. Ireland had a lower divorce rate. Ireland had a lower abortion rate. Didn't even allow it. Irish women wishing abortions had to go to Great Britain. The only real endemic moral corruption in Ireland was the secret pedophilia, particularly by the Roman Catholic clergy. But outwardly, at least, it was not like this, even in my youth. It certainly is like that now. It's certainly like that now. It's the most morally bankrupt country in Europe. I say this with great sadness because my mother's family is of Irish descent. And I have family in Ireland. It's a very, very sad situation. But it points to the way Europe is going. If a once upon a time morally conservative country in the EU can become so radical in its downward depravity, the other countries will just fall in line and follow, follow suit. If there's a hope in Europe, it's the growth of churches in Eastern Europe. I'll be going to Bulgaria soon, and uh, I hope to meet the believers there well, I will be meeting the believers there, but I hope to find something better than exists in Western Europe. This is the world we live in. This is the world. Praise God for Jesus. Praise God for his promises. Now, I know Jesus told us these things in the Middle East and in Europe and in society at large. I know Jesus told us these things. But the rapid pace, again, at which they are transpiring is astounding to anybody, even to those who expected it. This Week in Prophecy, a very interesting debate between Thomas Ice and another pre-tribulationist. Now it is not simply the pre-trib people debating people who are not pre-trib. As we've warned, they are increasingly turning against each other. It began with this absurd proposition that the great falling away, the great apostasy, is the rapture, propagated again by Thomas Ice and others. But now it is the imminency advocates debating the traditional preacher people who hold the view that after the age of the church, the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, and chapter 4, verse 1, come up hither, that is the rapture. So those who state that the rapture is at the beginning of the seven years 
are now debating those who say it isn't. This has become more and more ridiculous progressively, but last week the absurdity has reached a new peak with what was released on the internet and YouTube of this debate that Thomas Ice had with another pre-tribulationist. Some of these people, like Chuck Missler, who's a friend of mine, a guy I like personally, says that there can be a 38-year period, a 38-year period between the rapture and the tribulation. That the rapture can happen before the tribulation up to 38 years. Thomas Ice is now leaning in the same direction. He's not saying 38 years, but a period of time. It could be years. What will those believers in that period be? If there was such a period, what would they be, even if there were such a period? You couldn't call them tribulation saints. <laughs> and they're not here for the rapture. The rapture already happened. These people are inventing a period of time. No place predicted or even suggested in Scripture. No place. Desperate to make the round peg fit into the square hole, they're actually inventing periods of time, virtual separate dispensations in dispensational terms, to try to somehow <coughs> get around the plain meaning of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The pre-trip position continues to fold like a cheap suit. They're arguing with each other now. They're continuing to fragment even among themselves. And they're becoming more and more absurd. The apostasy is the rapture. Traditional pre-trip people like Mark Hitchcock do not believe that. Or there could be a 38-year period, up to 38 years between the rapture and the tribulation. This is absurd. Where? Where is there anything in Scripture that even suggests anything like this? How would you even describe that period? The rapture is over, but the tribulation hasn't begun. How would you even describe it? There's no mention of it in Scripture. It's just something they invented to try to force the round peg into the square hole. Pre-trib is becoming less and less rational even within its own quarters, even within its own ranks, it is falling to pieces. Well, let it fall to pieces. The faithful church needs to realize the seriousness of the hour in which we live and prepare for what is coming and prepare for the return of Jesus, knowing that before he comes on the white horse, the Antichrist will also come on a white horse. And we need to recognize him when he does and know what to do about it. That is This Week in Prophecy. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast 
how the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.